Morning. Morning. All right, let's do this. Let's talk about grace. I'm going to ask you a question. There's the question. What do you think? What are your thoughts? Rion said no. Grace say still exists? Yep. It's not dependent. How genuine is grace without it though? It's just a question. Because we talk about grace and we understand grace but when we last week we put up Ephesians 2 8 and 10 which is by you are saved by grace right not of yourselves lest anyone should boast be able to say oh look what I did Jesus has done it all we can't do that ourselves okay but we are saved by grace so being saved by grace is a terrific thing but if we haven't received forgiveness in that grace then we're still in our sin we're still in this broken relationship with God. So there's, it's just a thought. But if we don't have forgiveness in grace, then can grace really be genuine? Because how do I extend grace to you without that measure of forgiving? So there's this person who's speeding along. He goes really, really fast. He goes past the police officer and the police officer goes chasing that person nobody in here, goes chasing that person, pulls him up and says, wow, you are going 25 kilometres over the speed limit. I'm going to, here's your ticket. You say, well, I can't really afford enough to pay you. Yeah, yeah, you should have thought of that before you, there you go. You've got to pay by this date. That's what we have on the ticket. The date comes and goes, you're expected to now turn up to court because you didn't pay. So now you're in court, <coughs> you're in front of a magistrate, and the police officer has to be there too because they've got to give their testimony. So you go through and the magistrate says to you, what's your excuse for speeding? And you say, none, I've got no excuse, I was speeding. Right, you haven't paid, so you'll go to jail for 30 days. Yep. You go, oh no, what am I going to do now? I can't, I can't afford to pay. I am guilty, I can't get out of this. I'm going to have to go to jail. Police officer stands up, walks over to the magistrate and says, um, I care for this person. I'll do their jail term. Whoa. Have you had a police officer do that for you? <laughs> it's an amazing thing, Grace. And I think... For it to be genuine, now I agree, it exists without it, but to be genuine, there's got to be some connection to forgiveness. And if we extend grace to one another, that's the power of it, to see that forgiveness actually, uh, the grace actually work, to know that we're forgiven when we've hurt each other. That's part of it. This is a great family that you have all together here. We have some terrific long-standing relationships we have some new relationships we have deepening relationships and all of that and maybe we have some relationships that need to be built a little bit better but in all of that when there's a love foundation the grace foundation forgiveness really reigns in all of that too i think i mentioned last week that you with forgiveness it's not something that comes upon you it's something you decide to do it's an action you take only when you put that into action does God start to heal the heart. See, we think, no, no, when God heals my heart, then I'll forgive. And he's saying, no, no, it's the other way around. And this is the, one of the reasons. I think this verse is incredibly powerful. Instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Why? Why should I? Read the rest of the verse. Let's read it together. Just as God has forgiven you. There's your why. Why should I do it? Because he's done it for you. How much should I forgive? How much have you been forgiven? Oh, but you don't realise how much I've been hurt by people here or somebody else or whatever. And God goes, yeah, I know. I've been hurt a lot. We tend to think around 
forgiveness around some conflict things and sometimes when I'm working with people I ask them what's the most important thing to you the conflict or the relationship because if you say conflict in other words I have to win this argument or I have to win this conflict I have to win that means the relationship is either going to be damaged or completely broken but the moment we switch and we say relationship and it's amazing how many people will say to me relationship is the most important thing I ask them this next question fine that's terrific then what are you prepared to sacrifice in order to restore that relationship and I can't tell you how many times maybe nine times out of ten that person will say to me me what about the other person I'm only one percent of the problem they're 99 percent of the problem and I ask them to own that 1%. I just say, fine, tell me about your 1%. And they'll go, oh, it's not even 1%, it's probably only half a percent. Okay, then own the half a percent. Oh, it's not even half a percent. Why are you bothering with this? They're the big problem. And of course, when you talk to them, the percentage, we've only got 2% of the problem covered because they own one and they own one and 98 of it sits out there as if Here's the thing. God puts us on this planet and he says to us, I love you. I want this relationship. I hope you love me too. I'm going to give you the, the opportunity to do that out of your free will. Here's a choice to do it. So Adam and Eve are in this beautiful garden. They're spending time with God and the imagery that we have in the language in Genesis is that God walked with them in the garden. Do you imagine that? How incredible is that? Christina playing in the background, God walking in with Adam and Eve. And God is going, oh, do you like that stream? Adam and Eve are going, wow, it's just beautiful. We love drinking out of it. It's awesome. God, look at that, that, that plant you made there. It's beautiful. What do you call it? God said, rhododendron. That's fantastic. Adam, what are you going to name that animal over there? Rhinoceros. And when Eve came along, she said, why would you put an H in that word for? Nobody says the H. Why did you do that? It's already started, you see. Adam was complaining because Eve was always putting his favourite pants in a salad. Eve walked up to him one day, Adam, do you love me? And he said, who else? God has this amazing relationship and he says to them, this is all for you to enjoy. But I have to give you a choice and with choice, you've got to have two things to choose from. Choose me and stay in that love relationship or choose against me, but our relationship would be broken if you do that. Adam and Eve chose to go against him. So now we have conflict. So what we're going to do is we're going to sit God the Father on the chair and say now, Father, God... Uh, there's a conflict. What's the most important thing to you? The conflict or the relationship? God immediately says, relationship. And then we say to him, what are you prepared to sacrifice in order to restore the relationship? Now, he's the only one, the only one that could have said, me? I haven't done anything wrong. You need to talk to those guys. But he doesn't. He owns it. What are you prepared to sacrifice in order to restore the relationship? And he says, my son. Oh. How does that now play into our minds about any time we have some conflict? How does that start to... Hmm. And be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Why? just as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That's so powerful, that stuff. I find, as I move around, I find people that hang on to this stuff and it cripples them and they don't understand how much damage it actually does to them. And I think it's, I don't know who put this together, but I think it's right. Not forgiving someone is like you drinking a cup of poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> I've drunk that! <laughs> 
Not so good. Sometimes we expect God to do things our way. Sometimes we want him to do what we think he should do. Just remember last week when I said we take that brush out of God's hand when he's painting. We go, I just would like to do that. And sometimes we're yelling at God to paint this way. Paint my life this way. And he's saying, will you just let me at it? You ever been in that? (laughs) Where you think God's not talking and we should get this and we need an answer to that and we get angry with God. Don't think he doesn't know. So you say, oh no, don't tell God I'm angry as if he doesn't know. (laughs) Habakkuk, I think I mentioned last week, Habakkuk, read that book. You'll find a person that's even angrier than that. And God answers, but probably not the way Habakkuk was anticipating it would go. But in the end, Habakkuk says, okay, I trust you. I trust you. See, your alternative is, is to not trust God. And I want to know where you're going to go with that. Yeah, but he's not doing what I want him to do. Do you believe he loves you? Do you believe he knows what's best? Do you believe he is actually sovereign in control of this whole planet? And sometimes we go, but if that's true, then why doesn't he? And just like that, we get angry and he says, let me remind you, I love you. I know what I'm doing. And I'm in charge. And if we can come to peace with that, all these things that we experience, we go, okay, I don't like the journey sometimes, but I know it's right. Sometimes we need to be woken up and sometimes in broken relationships we go to God and until we can see things his way, we just won't understand what's going on. And that takes, takes a bit of effort. If we could just catch a glimpse of each other through God's eyes, how different we might behave, how different we might treat each other. And I believe this to be true, that genuine grace is seen in the way we treat one another. You know, In Acts chapter 2, when the church was born, essentially, the body of Christ as we know it was born, the people gathered together, they prayed together, they had Bible teaching together, they remembered the things that Jesus had taught them, they shared together, they did communion together, they gave sacrifice to each other. It was an amazing thing because the impact of that was the people around them were seeing this, knowing this. And they were coming to say to those people, whatever it is that you have, we want. We want to be part of it. And it says there that every day people were coming to know Jesus. Why? Because they saw in these Christians love for each other and caring and sharing for each other. Because I believe in those moments, not that they didn't have a rough ride as well, they're just people like us. But I believe in those early stages especially, they were seeing each other through God's eyes. And they experienced grace powerfully. And I think in this world we get so caught up with all the stuff that's going on and we get overwhelmed by it and sometimes we get swamped and things happen and people say stuff and people do stuff and we get upset and we lose sight of those people, of these relationships that we should be looking at through God's eyes. It's a powerful thing for each and every one of us. I'm going to quickly put up a few of these because there's heaps of these in the New Testament. These are all the one another's in the New Testament. Right at the very top is the one that should drive all of them. Bless you. John 13, 34 and 35 says this, A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. And then he tells you how. As I have loved you. And it goes on to say that you have love for one another and when you have this kind of love for one another, what, what's the effect? Does anyone remember the rest of the verse? 
All the world will know that you're my disciples. All will know what I mean to you. Everyone will know it. Who was here Wednesday night? Well, where were the rest of you? I feel disappointed. I'm kidding. I got safe to read something from Mr. or Mrs. Google. I don't know. I don't know that it has a gender. Dr. Google. <laughs> but I just asked her to read out, just start typing in why are uh, Christians, and you know what the top hit is? So mean. That's, uh, see, if we're doing that, that would never be, why are Christians so loving? Why are Christians so accepting? Why are Christians so caring? Why are Christians so mean? Because <laughs> we hate everyone, that's what it is. We just hate everyone. That's not right. Love one another. Look at this now. Be, that's the word, be kindly affectionate to one another. Giving preference to one Preference? What about my preference? <laughs> yeah, giving preference to one another. Be of the same mind toward one another. That doesn't mean you all have to think the same, but it's you can share and then be aiming at the same purpose together, driven by that. Let's not judge one another. Edify, build up, be like-minded toward... By the way, as I go through these things, you need to understand that every one of those in the, in the language is written in the imperative. Now, what does that mean? What does imperative mean? It's, it's a command, that's right, or a command over here. Um, it's a command. God is not saying to us, if you don't mind, if you've got nothing better to do and if it's not too inconvenient, would you mind loving one another? These are commands. You, you and I don't have an option around this. Look at these other ones. Receive, admonish, greet one another with a holy kiss. <laughs> now, just before you start getting ideas, guys... You start thinking, there's a couple of girls I didn't greet with a kiss this morning. It's usually men to men and girls to girls. And you go, oh, man. Now, I come from a Greek background. We didn't have to get that command. It's just, this happens. Just happens. That's how we greet each other. It's affection. It's care. What we've turned that into in the modern day is this. Yeah, love you, brother. Yeah. And give him a kiss. <laughs> well, we could hug. It's a good hug. You and I, Santa, after we know a hug. When I grow up, I'm going to have a beard just like that. Don't deprive one another. Wait for one another. Have the same care for one another. Here's the kiss one again, just in case you didn't get it. Okay? And then it just goes on. Serve one another. Oh, don't be conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. There's a negative one. Bear one another's burdens. And that's a really powerful one in there in Galatians 2. But 6, 1 and 2 are important and verse 3. So 6, 1 says, if, if you see a brother or sister overtaken in a fault, if they've stepped out of the path of the spirit, as it were, it says, you who are spiritual, how long does it take you to become spiritual? Now, it's a trick question. It didn't say mature, I said spiritual. Like that. Because all you have to do is make sure you're right with God. If there's something to confess, confess it, and you are in the right place. Maturity is going to take some time. Spiritual is right away. You who are spiritual, Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. There's a word we don't use very much. What does the word meekness mean to us these days? What does meek mean? We've kind of used the word gentle in its place. It's not quite right. Humble? It has a humility attached for sure. Oh, good. Who said that? If I had a chocolate... You'd get half of it because you're close. I'd eat the other half. 
When we were uh, in Bible school, we went to this lion park outside of Sydney and they had a tiger there as well. And when we got there, there was this tigress that had given birth to a couple of cubs. And here we were looking, we were, oh, wow, because there was this 250 kilo silent death walking back and forth in the cage with the cubs over here and she's looking at us her eyes do not move off and we're just standing there wow she's beautiful and this big furry head looking at us going just can't wait to get my <laughs> teeth around you so we were just we were admiring she was amazing she's walking back and forth and she's padding along 250 kilos not a sound then the cub starts making noise. So she goes over the cubs and she picks them up one at a time in her mouth and takes them over to this other side in where there was some straw. Amazing. Picks up the other one and takes it over there. Didn't hurt it. We had some lunch and then we, the guy that was sort of running the show said, look, you need to get in your bus now and just drive through the park and we're going to let the tigress out to feed her, you'll love this. But as we're going through, there's signs all over the place. Do not stop. But you can't get good pictures if you don't stop, right? So all the students are in there, and there's 12 of them at the time, and I'm driving. Oh, just stop for a minute, because here she is. And she was coming towards us. So we, I stopped, I'm looking around in case we get into trouble. And I stop, and everyone on this side of the bus is just leaning over and taking pictures of this tigress, and she's just sitting there looking up at us. Just awesome. And then without any advance warning, she didn't tell us a thing, she jumped up and pounced and put her paws on the side of the, the bus. Now, the bus went, wah, like that. And there's two reasons for that. One, she weighs 250 kilos. Two, when you have 12 students move from this side to that side of the bus <laughs> in the twinkling of an eye, the bus goes wah. And then, as if you could do it, we had 12 part harmony all going, drive! <laughs> and I'm gone. And I look in the rear vision mirror and I will swear to this day that tigress was laughing. incredible creature what's the point of that i don't know this is a good story no here's the thing the word meekness means power under control get the picture with her she could have rolled us and yet she picks up cubs in her mouth and moves them over here without damaging one little bit and she just takes them over there See, we have an incredible amount of power in the words we say and the things that we do. As human beings, we have the ability to really encourage someone and build someone up or destroy them. And what this is saying to us, bear one another's burdens, is in that first verse it says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, power under control, lest you also be tempted. And it tells you how to do that. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ again? Love one another. Pretty powerful, isn't it? And it just goes on. Bear one another's burdens, bearing with one another, tolerating, that's the idea, kind, forgiving, which we talked about, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, submitting to one another, do not lie to one another, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, teaching and admonishing. Look at these, comfort one another, comfort each other. Look, it's just amazing. So what, I, what I'm hoping that you'll get in all of this is that if we did these things, the grace of God would be seen all over the place. And people would say, I want to know that grace because people in this world or this world's system of behaviour is anything but gracious is anything but. Remember I said last week, three things about grace. It's a little scary. The other things, anyone remember? It's a risk. Yeah, because when you extend grace to someone, 
they may abuse it. God, if you extend grace to all these people, they'll abuse it. No, I know. I love them. But Lord, they'll, they'll, they'll trample on it. Yeah, I know. But I love them. But Lord, they, they, they won't accept it. Yes, some will. Others won't. Others won't see what an incredible gift that it is. But I'm hoping that if you're sitting in this room, you've experienced that gift of love. You've experienced that grace. And you're able to also extend it to one another because that's how it works. So where, where do we go now? What do we do now? That's the thing. I'm going to leave you with this. One thing. There's only one thing. What's the one thing? That's what you have to figure out. Because right now, in every one of us, we know there's at least one thing we need to address. There's one thing we need to do that's more than any other. And it might be that we need to talk to God about something in our lives. That's good. It might be that we need to praise him some more. That's a good thing. It might be that someone else is sitting in here, we know we're in a hurt or damaged relationship. There's your one thing. Go and restore. It might be that it's one of those one another verses. As you were reading it today, as you were going through it, God just put his finger on your heart like that and said, that's the one for you. Because he knows one thing out of that list that you need to address and I need to address. But each of us need to figure out what's that one thing I need to do today or tomorrow or this week that I know I should do. What's your one thing? You have to think about that. If you're not sure, I know God's very interested in helping you with that one thing and bring some clarity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace that breaks the shackles, that sets us free. Father, and in that freedom, our prayer is today that we would use that freedom to do the right thing. Father, that we would not trample on that grace, but we would accept it with both hands and our hearts and that we would then extend it to our brothers and sisters right around us. That, Father, we would let go of things that we think we deserve to, al to allow you to do great things in our lives. Father, I want to thank you for this church. I want to thank you for the, the leadership that you have here. I pray that you'll grant them wisdom and clarity of thought and speech. Father, for ministry leaders and people that are serving in any way they can, I thank you for them. And I pray that as this church continues on and with Russell and Lois moving on, I pray that you'll continue to grant the wisdom and grant the grace that is needed to move forward. I pray more than anything that everyone in this room and those that would call themselves part of Lighthouse would grow in purpose and unity with you and each other. And Father, that the world, this community right here in Masterton would see grace and love right here and want to be part of it. We thank you for what you've done, but we thank you, Father, for what you are going to do. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everyone.